a resident of Glynn County, a graduate of Brunswick High, a son, a brother, a young man with dreams was gunned down in this community. As we understand it, he left his home apparently to go for a run, and he ended up running for his life. Death to the enemies of America. Leave this country if you hate our freedom. Tonight, the men accused of the horrific rampage on a Portland train, 35-year-old Jeremy Christian, made a belligerent first appearance in court. The damage you have caused is too great, and the people you have hurt are too valuable to this community. You will never see the light of day as a free man ever again. Racism and the hatred that goes along with it continues to be one of the biggest stains upon our society. Despite how much progress we have made throughout the years, or even the hard work of civil rights activists, there are still some people who seem to be determined to hate innocent people simply because of the color of their skin. In this video, you will find some truly hateful and evil racist murderers as they find out that they will be spending the rest of their lives behind bars. Two people died. A third was hurt, but survived. There was help that was needed, and I tried to help. Headlines about white supremacy and mass violence shoved a grieving no city into a global spotlight. Jeremy Christian is a white supremacist who in 2017 was behind a deadly racist attack that took place on a Portland, Oregon Max train line. It all began with two young women who were simply riding the train and minding their business when Jeremy decided to target and harass them with an anti-Muslim slur-filled rant. Both of the girls that Jeremy decided to target were underage at the time. One was wearing a hijab and the other was African American. During his hateful rant, Jeremy used offensive language towards people of a lot of different ethnicities, but particularly directed his speech at the young women. When people approached him and told him to be quiet, Jeremy just raised his voice even more and started shouting about how he, as an American and as a taxpayer, had the right to say whatever he wanted. He told the girls that they needed to get out of America and go back to their home country. The two girls ended up standing up and moving to the back of the train to try and get away from Jeremy. Meanwhile, two men had witnessed what was going on and came forward to defend the girls. Their names were Talison Mardid Namaki Meshi and Ricky Best. They put themselves in between the girls and Jeremy to block them from him. Then they told them that they needed to either be quiet or get off the train. This completely enraged Jeremy even more, and he refused to leave. Another young man named Micah David Cole Fletcher came forward to try to help also. These tense moments leading up to Jeremy's attack were all captured on camera. Suddenly, Jeremy reached into his pocket and pulled out a sharp blade. Before anyone could react, Jeremy attacked Talison, Ricky, and Micah. It all happened in just about 12 seconds in total. The wounded men slumped to the ground. Panic broke out throughout the train and people began pushing and shoving one another. Everyone wanted to get off the train at once. In all the chaos, Jeremy blended in with the crowd and slipped out of the door of the train before anyone could stop him. Some people who had witnessed the attack did see Jeremy though as he tried to make an escape and they chased after him. In the meantime, other witnesses stayed on the train to call 911 and tried to do what they could to help the victims who were quickly bleeding out. Ricky, who was 52 years old and a U.S. Army veteran, passed away from his injuries while he was still on the train. Talison was rushed to the hospital, but he too would later die from his injuries. Micah was also gravely injured, but doctors were able to save his life. It wasn't long until law enforcement officers were able to track down Jeremy, and he showed absolutely absolutely no remorse for what he did. When he was told that two of the men he attacked died, his response was reportedly, that's what liberalism gets you. This is another one of his rants that was caught on camera.
Jeremy was charged with two counts of murder and one count of attempted murder, along with a bunch of other charges. Throughout the trial, a lot of different witnesses came forward to retell the story of what happened on that tragic day. I changed my, uh, you know, my space where I was where I was in the train um, to try and, you know, I guess shield them from from him, and uh, and maybe take some of whatever he was he was dishing out. And, and just kind of get him to kind of focus on me. The jury also found out about the fact that the train attack wasn't the first time his strange belief system had caused him to lash out in public. Check out this clip from before the murders. Take your mask off and debate! That's why I'm here! This is my soapbox! Portland, Oregon, the Northwest! We got... Supreme Court rulings for our freedom of speech since the 50s and 60s in the Northwest. Jeremy had supposedly become even more unhinged in recent years and was absolutely obsessed with exercising his right to free speech no matter who he offended. Revolution, you're not revolutionary, you got your face covered. Christian, according to the evaluation, had become obsessed with the right to free speech. Jeremy had been causing problems within the community for a long time. His name is Jeremy Christian, and this is is the mugshot police sent out the morning after the attack. At that time, the Portland native was 35 years old, had already served time in prison for robbery. At the time of the murders, Jeremy was already a felon. He was clearly dangerous and had already committed multiple crimes and pretty much displayed every sign that he would commit a crime again. So why was he ever released from prison in the first place? I blame the system for creating and facilitating people like Jeremy and then we, the community, have to deal with them. In my case, the white supremacists got special treatment. Listen to this outburst that Jeremy made the second he was brought into the courtroom for his trial. It was definitely a sign of what kind of behavior he was going to continue to display. Death to the enemies of America. Leave this country if you hate our freedom. Tonight, the man accused of the horrific rampage on a Portland train, 35-year-old Jeremy Christian, made a belligerent first appearance in court. Outside of the courthouse, Micah, the victim who survived, talked to the press about how grateful he was to have been able to see Jeremy face justice. I feel very lucky. I wish I wasn't the only lucky one right now. He acknowledged that the two men who put themselves between Jeremy and the young women died as heroes. They were willing to sacrifice their lives to help other people. Two men who worked very hard to build lives, to create connections, to have love, lost their lives. And, um, there's nothing more special than that. The court would also hear from Destiny Magnum, who was one of the young women that Jeremy had been harassing the day of the attack. He told us to go back to Saudi Arabia. After what can only be described as a long and exhausting trial, the jury made up their decision and convicted Jeremy Christian. We the jury duly impaneled and sworn in the above entitled cause to find our verdict upon the count submitted to us as follows on count one. Uh, the verdict is guilty, that's murder in the first degree. Even after being convicted, Jeremy still didn't show any remorse. When he was given the chance to make a statement prior to his sentencing, he only defended his actions. I've been brought up in Portland, Oregon. I went to the blackest high school in Oregon. Where I'm from, we defend ourselves. Where I was brought up in North Portland, we defend ourselves. If anything, he seemed proud of what he had done. I chose violence. People died. You survived. I understand your feelings of guilt. You should apologize to the families, not for not being there, but for being the main contributor of their deaths. Right before he was sentenced, one of the women he had been harassing on the train came forward to share her story. And when she addressed Jeremy, he burst into an angry rage. Well, I hope you rot. See you there. Yeah, okay. Go back to Tennessee, no, too. You, what do I tell Go you? Go back to Tennessee, too. You can we don't want you here. Bye. All your race Bye. Bye. You ain't gonna be mayor either. You ain't gonna be mayor either. Jeremy received two life sentences for his crimes.
Well, new tonight, a racist killer's jailhouse confession. His words could bring down other members of the KKK. We talked to a former inmate who has documents from Edgar Ray Killen. In them, Killen implicates others in the infamous 1964 killing of three civil rights workers. Edgar R. Killen was a former member of the KKK. Throughout his life, he did many, many disturbing and evil things. But among the most horrible things were the murders of three black men, James Chaney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner. These men were civil rights workers, and their murders took place in Mississippi in 1964. Edgar died in prison, but many don't believe that he ever had to face the true punishment for what he did. This is because he wasn't actually arrested until 2005, and he was 80 years old by the time his case went to trial and he was convicted. Mr. Killen, do you have any comments? It's hard to believe that a convicted member of the KKK would tell his story to a black man. But after a year in the state prison system, locked up in the same medical ward as Edgar Ray Killen, James Stern claims he became Killen's confidant. Edgar died days before his 93rd birthday, so his time behind bars was not very long at all. But when he was in prison, he ended up confessing to things that law enforcement didn't even know about. Ironically, it was an African-American fellow inmate who Edgar decided to confess these things too. Did he ever admit to you any crimes that he committed that no one knows about? 32. 32 cold cases of, of murders that he personally participated in. He, per, he personally performed himself, yes. I says, I'm a black man. I said, you got a few white guys in here who's trying to suck up to you every day you know, fellow Klansmen. The fact that there were 32 murders that Edgar was behind and never faced justice for is shocking. It makes you wonder how many other former members of hate groups like the KKK could still be walking around free. This cell phone video captures the final moments of Ahmaud Arbery's life while he was jogging through this Brunswick, Georgia neighborhood in February. Arbery was confronted by Gregory McMichael and his son Travis, who shot Arbery twice with a before the 25-year-old collapsed and died. The murder of Hamad Arbery was horrific and an incredibly senseless crime that shocked the nation and enraged many. It took place in February of 2020 in Brunswick, Georgia. Ahmad, a 25-year-old African-American man, had been minding his own business and trying to get some exercise. He went out for a run in a local neighborhood and ended up getting chased and ultimately murdered by three men for no reason. These men were Gregory McMichael, his son, then 34, year old Travis McMichael and their neighbor, William Roderick Roddy Bryan Jr. Travis McMichael believed that Ahmad could have been behind a recent burglary in the area, but he had no actual proof of this at all before he made the decision to chase him. In fact, just days before Ahmad's murder, Travis had actually called 911 on another African American man because he believed that he was trespassing on a nearby property that was under construction. What did he look like? Uh, it's a black male. Red shirt, white shorts. Are you okay? Yeah, yeah. When I, it just startled me. Um, when I turned around, when I turned around and saw him and backed up, he reached into his pocket and ran into the house. So I don't know if he's armed or not. But Ahmad Arbery was not a criminal. He was just a normal guy who had been out for a job when he was targeted because of the color of his skin. My son was not committing a crime. He was out for his daily jog and he was hunted down like an animal and killed. On the day that Ahmad was killed, Travis spotted him running by and flagged down his father, Greg, and their neighbor, Roddy. Together, they began to chase Ahmad. Eventually, they began physically fighting and Travis reached for his firearm. Ahmad attempted to try to wrestle the weapon away, but was killed in the process. Did Mr. Bryan ever say that Ahmad had a weapon no. on him that day? No, ma'am. Okay. Did Mr. Bryan ever say Ahmad made any verbal threats towards him or any other person that day? No. Months went by before the three men who were involved in the murder were arrested and charged. In fact, Ahmad's mother wasn't sure if her son's killers would ever face justice for what they did. This day, as we stand before this courthouse, I thought this day would never come. Oh, yeah. We know our book, and we kept searching for answers. But guess what? It's God. We didn't give up. During the trial, the 911 call Gregory McMichael made just a short time before the murder was played in court. 911, what's the address emergency? Uh, 
I'm not here to tell the stores. It's a black male running down the street. So tell where, where, where at Satella so Shores? I don't know what street we're on. It, stop right there. Is it? Stop. Tell it. Sir, hello, sir. Sir, where you at? You hear him talking to the dispatcher, and then you hear the call abruptly cut out. Well, this is a very tricky issue, and it really goes to the heart of the case. The tapes make the McMichaels sound like they're responsible citizens reporting crimes. Travis McMichael even apparently comes face to face with Aubrey a couple of weeks before the fatal encounter. Throughout the trial, the defense painted Travis, Gregory, and Roddy as well-meaning citizens who had just been trying to do their civic duty by stopping Ahmad, who they believed had been committing a crime. But the prosecution said that these men were racist, cold blooded killers. So what side would the jury believe? In November of 2021, people all over the nation and in countries all around the world waited anxiously to hear the verdict. Travis McMichael was up first. Count one, malice murder. We the jury find the defendant, Travis McMichael, guilty. Oh. I'm going to ask that whoever just made an outburst be removed from the court, please. As this court has indicated, I ask that there be no outbursts in the court, and I expect as much from the gallery. Next, his dad, Gregory McMichael. Count two, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Greg McMichael, guilty. Count three, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, Greg McMichael, guilty. Then finally, Roddy Bryan. Count one, malice murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, William R. Bryan, not guilty. Count two, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, William R. Bryan, not guilty. Count three, felony murder. We, the jury, find the defendant, William R. Bryan, guilty. It was the verdict that many people had been hoping for, including Ahmad's mother, Wanda Cooper. Before sentencing, she had the chance to address the court and give a very emotional victim impact statement. Oh, I want to first speak directly to my son, if I please. This verdict doesn't bring you back, but it does help bring closure to this very difficult chapter of my life. She also called out her son's killers for their lack of remorse. Son, I love you as much today as I did today that you were born. Raising you was the honor of my life, and I'm very proud of you. Your honor, these men have chose to lie and attack my son and his surviving family. They each have no remorse and do not deserve any leniency. The judge presiding over the case also took the time to make a statement. He condemned the actions of Ahmad's killers and all actions of racism. Let me start with this statement. As we all now know, based upon the verdict that was rendered in this court in November, Ahmad Arbery was murdered. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy on many, many levels. The judge pointed out that all Ahmad did was go for a run. As an American, he should have been free to do that without ever having to fear for his life. A resident of Glynn County, a graduate of Brunswick High, a son, a brother, a young man with dreams was gunned down in this community. As we understand it, he left his home apparently to go for a run and he ended up running for his life. 
Travis and Greg McMichael were sentenced to life in prison with no parole plus 20 years. Roddy was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Was it a fair sentence? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Today, a judge sentenced Russell Courtier to life in prison. He killed 19-year-old Larnell Bruce in Gresham back in 2016. The case of Russell Courtier and Colleen Hunt took place in 2016, and it is nothing short of disturbing and horrific. It is a story of an evil man who literally went out of his way to brutally kill a man for no reason other than the fact that he was black. The victim was 19-year-old Larnell Bruce, and on August 10th of 2016, Larnell had been standing outside of a 7-Eleven in Oregon. He was minding his own business and hadn't been hurting anyone. All of a sudden, Russell Cordier came by in a Jeep. His then-girlfriend, Colleen Hunt, was in the passenger seat. Russell, a racist gang member, spotted Larnell and intentionally drove him over with his vehicle before fleeing the scene. Days later, the teen would tragically pass away from his injuries. Eventually, both Russell and Colleen would be arrested. He was charged with murder and of committing a hate crime while she was charged with manslaughter. Ultimately, they were both convicted. Colleen was sentenced to 10 years behind bars while Russell received life in prison with no possibility of parole. Well, the victim's family says they feel a sense of relief. Their focus now is spreading love. 40-year-old Russell Courtier teared up during today's hearing, but the victim's family believes it was all for show. The judge says he was driven by hate and anger when he ran over and killed Larnell Bruce in August of 2016. Larnell's young life was cut short by a man who didn't even know him. But when all is said and done, his life will live on through others because he was signed up to be an organ donor before his death. This allowed for his organs to save the lives of other people. The victim's family met with us after the hearing surrounded by green balloons to promote organ donation. They say Bruce's organs helped save five people. As for the man now sentenced to life in prison, they say they hope he realizes how much they all have lost. Larnell's dad, Larnell Bruce Sr., hopes that people will not continue to hold anger and hatred in their hearts for the man who did this to his son, because anger and hatred is ultimately what led to his death. Through this trial, my emotions were all over the place. It, was, it wasn't until um, I took the time to realize what he lost too, that it made sense to me that it, it would do me no good to, to approach it angrily, because that's what got us here to begin with. And we begin with the emotional hearing in a Buffalo courtroom. The white supremacists who killed 10 black people at a neighborhood supermarket last May, hearing from the families of his victims, confronting him with their pain and anger before he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. If there's one thing that this next case proves, it's that deadly hate and racism can exist in people of all ages, even those who are just starting their lives. Peyton Gennard, a white supremacist, was just 18 years old when he became one of the most hated men in America for opening fire in a grocery store on May 14th of 2022. The grocery store was called Topps Family Supermarket, and it was a place where prime primarily African-American men and women shopped. Peyton knew this, and he specifically targeted this particular grocery store because of this fact. Peyton, armed with a deadly weapon he had no business even owning, entered the grocery store that day with one mission. His mission was to kill as many black people as he possibly could. While he carried out his hate-fueled attack, he live-streamed the entire thing and yelled racial slurs as he charged into the store. The shoppers all ran for their lives in different directions directions, while chaos broke out within the store. They tried to take cover where they could by getting to areas where Peyton's weapon couldn't reach them. Some shoppers, with the help of a few employees, were able to get to the employee break room in the back and lock the door behind them. Others ran to hide behind the milk coolers, but Peyton chased after them as if he was a predator stalking his prey. In total, Peyton took the lives of 10 innocent victims and injured three more. Law enforcement was able to arrive on the scene quickly. They had to treat the situation delicately in order to take down Peyton before he could hurt anyone else or turn the weapon on himself 
something that he was threatening. For him to die in that store before he could be prosecuted was not the justice that his victims deserved. The cops negotiated with Peyton and were able to convince him to drop his weapon. As soon as he did, they quickly arrested him and took him into custody. He confessed to everything, including the fact that he had wanted to kill as many black people as possible, and he had purposefully driven hours away from his hometown in order to go to this grocery store where he knew he would probably be able to successfully kill a lot of his intended victims. This whole attack down to the last detail had been carefully planned. He had thought about it for a long time. He did research ahead of time and prepared for it. He was excited to kill these people. Peyton was charged with murder and initially pleaded not guilty. He would later change his plea to guilty after learning that if he didn't, the prosecution was seeking death for him. His plea would keep him alive, but it wouldn't keep him from facing justice. In the courtroom for his trial, things often got heated. At one point, a family member of one of the people who were killed got up and lunged at Peyton to try and take justice into their own hands. One point, a grieving family member rushing forward, trying to reach the gunman seated at the defense table, court officers jumping in to hurry the gunman away. In court, one person after another came forward to talk about their loved ones who Peyton had selfishly stolen away from them. Tonight, the pain of that racist attack at a Buffalo supermarket roared into court as families of the 10 black men and women dead faced their loved one's killer. Some of them were family members and others were friends, but they had all been touched by the life of one of the victims in a personal way. While I was writing this, tears fell from my eyes. Thinking about what a beautiful person you took. Before he was officially sentenced for his unspeakable crimes, Peyton Ginrod was given the chance to speak up for himself and make a statement. To the surprise of many, he apologized for the pain he had caused and the lives he had cut short. I'm very sorry for all the pain I forced the victims and their families to suffer through. I'm very sorry for stealing the lives of your loved ones. I cannot express how much I regret all the decisions I made leading up to my actions on May 14th. Was he truly sorry for what he had done, or was he just hoping the judge would have mercy on him and maybe be more lenient with sentencing if he believed he had remorse? We may never know for sure. But the judge made it very clear to Peyton, everyone in the courtroom, and people all around the country, that Peyton's evil and racist actions could not be forgiven, and they could not be excused. It didn't matter if Peyton was sorry or not, because there was nothing he could ever say or do that could undo the incredible damage he caused. And there was no way he could bring back those 10 lives. There is no place for you or your ignorant, hateful, and evil ideologies in a civilized society. There can be no mercy for you, no understanding, no second chances. The judge told Peyton that because of his actions, he no longer deserves the right to freedom. He didn't deserve the right to be out in the world with other people. The only place he would ever belong would be behind bars. The damage you have caused is too great, and the people you have hurt are too valuable to this community. You will never see the light of day as a free man ever again. Finally, the judge announced the sentence that many people were already expecting and knew was coming, but still wanted to hear him say it anyways. Peyton would spend the rest of his life in prison, and he would never get the chance to get out for as long as he lives. He will die while he is behind bars. It is the judgment of this court for your conviction under the first count of the indictment, a domestic act of terrorism motivated by hate in the first degree an A1 felony, that you be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole. His official sentence was 11 life sentences with no parole. Do you think that this is a fair sentence, or do you believe that Peyton should have paid with his life for the horrible crimes he committed? Which of these racist crimes do you consider to be the most horrific? Let us know what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more.